So good morning. Hello. Um, can everybody hear me fine? Yeah. Okay. Um, so hello. My name is uh, Christian Sandor. I'm a German, but now I've been living abroad for six years. And basically, my talk today will be. So I will speak about first very quickly who am I, because probably you don't know me, so you can get some information. After that, I want to speak about the state of the art of augmented reality research. Also a little a bit about commercial things, but mainly about um, research. And the third part of my talk, I will speak about the future, because I think augmented reality now has a very exciting future. So first part about myself. So yeah, so I'm from Munich, Germany. Um, and since 2000, so 12 years now, I have worked on augmented reality, and more specifically on human-computer interaction. Um, and basically in 2000, this was my master's project, and after that I did my PhD also at Munich and, uh, TU Munich and also Columbia University, because my second advisor was Professor Feiner from Columbia University. After I completed my PhD, I worked for two years in Japan at Canon's Leading Edge Technology Research Headquarters. Um, and after that, so since 2008, I'm a senior lecturer at the University of South Australia. And mainly now we are working with Canon on indoor augmented reality and Nokia on outdoor augmented reality. Okay, so this is a very brief summary of who I am, of my past. So first I want to start by showing you uh, my master's project, which was in 2000. So please keep that in mind. Um, and it's interesting because I think this project is 12 years old, but now you can see many companies who are doing a very similar thing. So it took kind of 12 years to go from research to products. So I show you that. This is Munich. So basically in this project we made a mobile augmented reality system for navigation. Is this okay to hear? Back then, Bluetooth was very, very new. You can see it's a head-worn display and a backpack computer. So you put several laptops, so it's me, um, several laptops and some camera on top. And you can see this is what people could see through the head-worn display. So they could see this is a simple environment model, so like a map. And of course it's aligned, so as you walk, this red point is moving and also it's orienting itself correctly. Okay, but this is very old. Okay, so after that, no big jump. So this is now 2011. So um, last year, a company made a documentary about my research laboratory. So this is now some f small segments from that. So. Christian Sandor is one of the world's leading experts on augmented reality. Following a doctorate in computer science from Munich University, Christian worked at Canon's leading edge technology research headquarters in Tokyo. There he created a design environment that enables users to see and touch virtual objects. Christian founded the aptly named Magic Vision Lab at the University of South Australia in 2009. Here, Recently, the team at Magic Vision Lab have been fine-tuning the haptic augmented experience. In a unique collaboration between award-winning CG artist Matt Swoboda and the Institute for Computer Graphics and Vision... See again, this is a head-worn display, Magic. so you can overlay they graphics. ...a profound manipulation of our perception of our world and of ourselves. So here we basically set the user's hands on fire. The burning hand, actually, is also an experiment in that direction, because we were wondering... What is a very strong emotion that you can create through augmented reality? Okay, so, so this was a very quick uh, crash course about uh, myself. So next I want to speak about the state of AR research. Um, but before I do that, so first I quickly want to speak about the commercial side of things. Um, 
So one very interesting thing is you can see here, so this is Google Trends, and in Google Trends you can follow um, keywords, so how many times has a word been searched. And if you see, so the um, orange is virtual reality, and the blue one is augmented reality. And you can see in 2009 there was this crossover, that basically virtual reality is going down a little, and augmented reality is going up. And since 2009 this gap has actually been increasing a lot. So basically more and more augmented reality becomes very exciting and so now what is the reason for that right so the reason for that is it's based on commercial reasons I believe because if you see so this is in uh, 2009 this is a prediction by an American uh, uh, market research company and in 2009 their prediction was that in 2011 basically this line uh, is the sell of um, PCs and these bars are the sales for mobile phones. So actually in 2011, you can see there was a prediction of a break even and what really happened, because now also with um, tablet computers, actually so the mobile devices are more than PCs, right? So they are continuously sold. And I think that's the main reason why there is such a big interest here, because it's now possible to do augmented reality on mobile phones. So the movie I showed you in the beginning, right, was this backpack computer and head worn display and very complex, but now you can do much more powerful things with mobile phones. And this was a big enabler, right? Okay, but this is just a small thing about the commercial context. So now I want to speak about um, the research, right? So first I want to speak about fundamental technologies, because the most important technology probably is computer vision. Because whenever you overlay graphics in the real world, you need to know where is the person looking from. Because otherwise you cannot overlay collect correct graphics. Right? So and really, I think computer vision has three core functions for augmented reality. The first one is localization. This means uh, where am I? Right? So if you think of a city, then where are you in the city? And of course GPS can do it roughly, but you know in big cities GPS doesn't work most of the times. So when you have high buildings, um, it doesn't work. So it's, it's not so easy basically. Right? After you know where a person is, or a camera, right? because augmented reality you want to overlay graphics in a camera image normally, um, you need to do tracking. So this means if the camera is moving, you need to understand how the camera moves in space. The third function is mapping, so that means that you dynamically create 3D models of your environment. Right? Because let's say I want to show some graphics here on the table, of course I need to know that there's a table, right? otherwise it would have the wrong depth. Um, so these are the three functions. And now I think something very amazing happened, that during the last few years, these three things are almost solved. So when I started, these were very, very hard problems, but I think now the last few years, there were some very uh, important pro there was some very important progress. So the tracking and mapping problem, so this is now for indoors. I start with indoor because of course indoor is much easier than outdoors. I think the tracking and mapping is solved using Kinect Fusion, which you might have heard. So last year at the ISMAR, which is the leading augmented reality conference, so this was the best paper award by Microsoft Research, and I will show, show that to you in a moment. And after that, I think localization is uh, also solved for indoors. So one example is PTAM, but there are many other methods you could use. So first, the Kinect Fusion. So you see, this is Kinect Fusion. So this is one Kinect connected to a standard PC. And this is what's happening. So as you move the Kinect around, there will be a 3D model created of the room. And you can see it's very, very high quality. And also, this solves the tracking problem. Because in order to do this, you need to know where the camera is. Right? So maybe if I quickly go back here. Um, you can see you have this 3D model and then here you see the frostum or what the camera sees, right? And you know, you can see this is very precise, right? And this is a total unprepared environment and it works in any environment really. And now here you can see the quality of the 3D reconstruction. So, um, you can see for example, and also one interesting feature about Kinect Fusion is that it's refining. It's always refining. So the longer you use it, the better the model will get. Right? So basically here, there are some cables on the table, and as the Kinect is moved around, this is Im the quality is improving. And now also one very interesting thing, so you can see here on the laptop, there's a Dell logo, and this is just uh, maybe one millimeter high, but it's, it's visible in that video, right? so I think it's very remarkable. Um, also, what was very interesting because I attended this conference where this work was presented, and at the conference during the talk, they presented on stage a live demo. 
And I think that's always very remarkable because it shows it's really working. Yeah? Because many research projects, it's, yeah, okay, they can show a movie, but they cannot show it live. Right? So I think it's the highest art form for research to show live demos. So, and this is during their talk. So you can see here's the speaker. He's got the Kinect in his hand and he's pointing it at his laptop. And now what's happening, so you can see him. Ah, sorry. So what's happening, you can see he's with one hand holding the Kinect and with the other hand he's t touching his laptop and this is actually overlaid. So you can see where he's touching. So basically you can do multi-touch with everything, right? I could do multi-touch here on the wall, I can do multi-touch everywhere. Uh, so this is very, very remarkable, I think. Okay, so this is uh, Kinect Fusion and also there's an open source implementation now, so if you want to use that in your research, it's very easy to use. I can really recommend it. Now, example for PTAM, so this is localization problem, right? So you see this is now just one room and basically if you look here, it's identified, we are now in location one, this is identifying location two, and this is identifying location three. And this has been presented in a room scale model, so uh, basically in a building size model, sorry. So basically this is at the University of Oxford and they have a demonstration where you can do this in the whole building. So basically every room, every hallway, everything is recognized in this localization. Okay, so I think so indoor, there's very, very, very big progress and I think it's really solved. What you need for augmented reality to do indoors is it's there. Outdoor, now is my next part, and of course outdoor is much more difficult because, for example, the Kinect doesn't work outdoors, right? Because the Kinect is using infrared light, but outdoors you have um, sunlight coming, right? So which is interfering, so the Kinect doesn't work outdoors. But there are other ways how you can do mapping. And basically, so I speak about these three now. Right? So for mapping, I will show you Neftech, which is a company which was acquired by Nokia. And they basically have it all worked out. And after that, for tracking, I, there are several possibilities as well, what you can do outdoors. So one famous one is PTAM, which was the best paper at ISMAR in 2006. And another thing is a panorama tracker, and I'll show you a live demo in a minute. And Finally, I talk about localization, and I think this is currently the biggest problem, so I think it will be solved soon also, because now many companies like Google and Microsoft are putting very big efforts into that problem. So let me show you about mapping. So, so this is um, what Neftec is doing, so you see it's just this box, you can put it on a car, and then it makes this kind of very high quality model of cities. And it's really a full 3D model, it's a point cloud, a mesh, and also you have textures. Um, and basically this data exists yeah, for many, many cities and yeah, I think so you have some very, very good, and this is, sub, uh, this is millimeter precision, um, centimeter to millimeter, so you can get very, very high quality 3D models of cities. Okay, next I will show you a demo about the tracking on mobile phones. So this was done by Gerhard Reitmeier, our collaborator, so let me show you this one. So now I'm just using an iPhone. This is an iPhone 4S, so a new iPhone, but nothing special. <laughs> What's happening? Strange that I tried before the because I tried before and everything worked. Yeah. So I don't know what so did something change with the video setup? Ah, okay. Sorry for the delay. Okay, so let me. But of course, I need to say now, right? So this is there might be some problems now because this is a totally unprepared room. So I didn't know the room beforehand, and it's very dark. Right? So normally this is intended to be used outdoors, but I think it should work, so let me try. Right, so what you can see here, so you can see basically these yellow points, right? So they are very, um, they are very static in the environment. So I can move my phone and these points stay. So even I can take my phone away, I can put it back, so it will snap back, right? And with that information really it means you know where the camera is located in the world, right? But you can see there's some problem. Okay, then maybe let me try on the ceiling. Mm. Right, but you get the idea basically, right? So you can see like now, 
um, I have tracking on my phone, right? Because still there are many demonstrations using marker technology, but I think it's very outdated, right? So state of the art is really to have something like this. And this is just using computer vision, so no sensors in the phone or gyroscope or anything. Okay, then back to my presentation. Okay, so this was a tr uh, mapping and tracking, I think both almost solved. So last thing I want to speak, uh, I want to show you is about, um, uh, it's about localization. So this is a talk at the TED conference, so it's quite a famous conference for technology entertainment design, and this was in 2010. And this is a talk by Blasi Agueras, who is a, a CTO in Microsoft Photosynth, which you might know. Um, but basically there he's showing Bing Maps. Yeah? So this is like Google Maps, Bing Maps, so you have a web client, and in this web client you can look at some, um, here you can see some city, basically some map, and on the map you can have some um, panoramas, so just like um, Google Street View. What is happening? Yes, so this is just like a Google Street View, but now what they can do, and this is very remarkable, so now he's calling somebody, right, just on the mobile phone, and this person is at this place. And now when this person is turning on video, then this video will be overlaid onto the Street View, right? So that means they have the technology just from, uh, from images, basically, to align them with a city model. So that's very, very interesting. So you can see here, this is the live video. Right, and it's registered correctly. And this was two years ago, right? So I think basically soon we can expect some very big release from Microsoft in that area. I'm quite sure. Okay, so so far I was speaking about um, tracking or computer vision, and I think this is uh, very close to being solved for augmented reality. So what are the problems now, right? So one big problem are head-worn displays. Because currently there are many startups which you might, which you might know, like Layar or Wikitude and so on, and they always um, assume, right, that people will take their phone, and uh, of course the phone now does some video image, like I just showed you, and you overlay things. But of course if you use that for more than one minute, it's uh, hurting you, right? It's very unergonomic to have this posture for a long time. So, of course what, what will happen and what you need is that you have your phone in your pocket and you attach a head-worn display, so just like glasses that can embed graphics, and you use it like that, right? Because it's very ergonomic and, yeah. So, and I think that's the biggest challenge now because it's very, very difficult. So one problem with it is that you need um, to know about optics. And actually, as far as I know, there are only about 10 universities worldwide that study optics. Right? And of course, it's a very difficult problem to have it very lightweight, very small, and have very high-quality graphics in your glasses. So I think that's currently the billion-dollar question. So if somebody can make a nice head warrant display, I think it's worth a billion dollar. Um, but of course, now there's our research, which is in the areas of computer graphics and human-computer interaction. And in the following, I will speak about this. Because, of course, I think now this kind of fundamental thing, like computer vision is solved, but now the problem goes to a higher level, right? So what are the graphics you show, what are the applications, and how can people understand the graphics? Right. So really now it's my last talk, so I will speak about the future. And there's a very famous quote by Alan Kay, which is a famous inventor, so he invented object-oriented programming, he invented lap the laptop, and he invented many things. Um, and his famous quote is, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So basically, I hope so in our lab we are doing the same thing, so really we invent the future. So I will show you now, for the rest of the talk, what we are currently doing, and you can see it's with companies together, so I really hope that this will change the future. Um, so basically, in the lab we are doing two things. So we work on outdoor and indoor augmented reality. So first I will start with outdoor augmented reality. And here really you can see it's like a typical scenario, right? So a person holds up a mobile phone, and then based on the mobile phone, we do some like special effects with the user's environment. Um, so first I will show you again an old project. So this was in uh, 2009, it was three years old. And at that time the mobile phones weren't so powerful. So what we did is, you can see here, this is a, basically a PC worn on a belt. And then we attached a touch screen um, to the PC, 
and you can see now the user can do some input and it's basically a simulation of a mobile phone right so to give you a quick idea how this looks like right so you have this camera and this pointing to the environment so it's just a street in Adelaide in Australia and then this is what's happening on the screen right so you see the video image and you can overlay some content but this was very important for us to have a prototyping platform now the other thing we needed we wanted to make a 3d model of our city right it's similar to the mapping problem what Navtech is doing and now you have to see that like, we are a very underfunded research laboratory and we can make a 3d model of a city so how does it work so this is what we did so this is our pipeline for making a textured 3D model. So basically we start here, so we, we used airplanes, so we collaborated with another university because they had planes with LiDAR sensors. And LiDAR sensors, you can imagine, it's uh, basically like for, um, basically you fly over a city and it's shooting lasers, and then you can triangulate points. And now this is the example of all the triangulated points. Now from these points, you can make a mesh, which is a solid model of the buildings. And at this stage, it's very accurate. So it's about 50 centimeter precision. And it was very, very fast. Yeah? So, and after that, we had the problem how to texture the model. For that, what we did is we took um, Google Street View, because you have panoramas. And we took these panoramas and did projective texturing. So I show that in the movie. So I can see this is, our, this is now some part of Adelaide. Next, we can show the point cloud that we got from the airplanes. After that, there was some meshing algorithm. So I can see now, of course you can see there's some noise here, but basically for the individual points, it's very good. After that, but still you can see now it's a, just a black model, so there's no color information. I can see this is what Google Street View provides, right? So Google Street View really has these panoramas. And now if you expand these, if you think about like balloons, right? You expand them, and when they hit the environment, then you can get this kind of reconstruction. And of course this is now not very high quality, but yeah, I think it shows some paths, right? Shows a complete pipeline. Then so the following, we use these models to create some uh, visualizations. Now, one big problem is this, right? So I have a mobile phone, and now I want to say, okay, where's the closest pharmacy or where's the closest ATM? So in this situation, yeah, when I look at some building, it can happen that the building I'm looking for is behind, right? So the problem we want to see things that are occluded. So how do you do this? And now for that, there are some techniques in um, information visualization. You can see here, for example, you have a cube, like a grid of cubes, and now you want to see the middle cube. But here you cannot see the middle cube because it's occluded. So now in this situation, what you do is you put some force field, and this force field repels all the occluders and also expands the cube in the center. And basically now the idea of our project was to use that in the real world. I can also show quickly, this was also an inspiration, this is very old, this is from 1981, it's the bifocal display. And this had a very similar idea, because always the problem is when you have a small screen, right? Let's say on a mobile phone, it's like this, right? So you have some big content, but really you can see only a very tiny thing. So how do you deal with it? And now this is even more remarkable, because when this video was made, this was in 1981, there were no powerful computers, right? So I think he's later showing um, the state of the art computer. So he's explaining about this problem. You can see this is the computer back then, right? So now, they basically, they wanted to also explore these space distortion techniques, but how could they prototype it? Because no computer was powerful enough to do it. So what they were doing, I explain a minute, but basically this is their technique, right? So we scroll, and this is without any distortions, right? So you, you have no overview. This is like reading a newspaper, but you have no overview, right? So the solution and what they invented in this project is focus and context. So you can see in the middle, it's a focus, so it's just a regular display. And on the sides, you have a context. So you can see basically, right, ah, so there's an image coming, and over there's a heading, so you get some idea. And the clever point about this is, so they prototyped this optically. So they prototyped it like this. So you can see this is, um, these are two, um, uh, how would you call this? Yeah. These are two rolls, and on these rolls there's a sheet of paper, and they film it with a camera. So I think very interesting. Okay, but basically based on these ideas, so we tried to do this in mobile augmented reality. 
And what we did is, so this is very similar now to the bifocal display. So you search for something, you search for an ATM, it's uh, outside of your field of view. And in this situation, we rotate it inside, right? So this is now just computer graphics, but now this is on the street. You search for an ATM and we can bend it inside so you can see it. This is based, it's just like a force field. And also what's remarkable about this, about this screenshot, because this part here is live video, right? This is what you see on your phone. And this part is the reconstructed model that we made. And now you can see how well it fits together. So here's the seam. And you can see here, this is the real video, and here's the virtual model. So it fits very well together. And also you can see it's very useful, right? Because very, very quickly, you can see where your target is, where you want to go. Um, and so this is a more schematic view, right? So you can see this is the situation. You have some buildings in front of you. This is your field of view, so what your camera sees. And many times, what you want is outside of the field of view. So then, basically, we do this kind of similar idea like the bifocal display. So we compress things, and now this building D is visible. And on the bottom, you can see also what's interesting. We have these rays that point to targets. And when these rays are bent, like here, even so, this is out of the screen, you get some idea where it's going to, right? You can see this point. Also now, here we have two rays, a red and a green one. So basically when the rays are bent, then uh, the color is changed. So the more you bend, the more the color changes. So this also gives you an idea that now the target on the right, it's a little difficult to see, but it's uh, further away. I mean, because you have to bend the ray more strongly. Um, now back to this problem I mentioned about uh, occluded points of interest. So you can see this the situation. You have this uh, building here, you're interested in it, but you cannot see it. And it's a very, very important problem. You see, you can see this is what Layar is doing, but any augmented reality browser, uh, current augmented reality browser, you can, they have the same problem, right? So they do this kind of uh, graphics, right? So you have some photo, how this building looks like. You have some radar, which shows you the direction to the building. Then you have some numbers here, which show you the distance, and you have some grid. But that means now, if you do eye tracking with this kind of interface, you will see that in order for a user to understand this building, he needs to look here, he needs to look here, he needs to look here. So he needs to look at many things at once, right? Which is basically very bad. So we try in our research to make a better visualization, yeah? to make a much better than this one. So, um, so this was before I went to Australia in 2008. The research lab had tried to do this already. Um, and what they did is this. Yeah? So you can see this is a 3D model of a certain area. And now they overlay it. But as you can clearly see, this is very poor also. I mean, it's better than what Layar is doing, but still it's poor because it looks like it's in front, right? So you have some building, and this looks, it's in front. It doesn't look like it's behind. So why is that? So let's continue. Um, so basically, I was about to explain this, right? Um, so. Right, so basically what we did is we did a 3D reconstruction of some courtyard, and this is now a wall. And this is now the view that we can present to a user. And I think this view is very clear, right, that the courtyard is behind the wall. If you compare with that system, right, the, the courtyard looks like it's in front, right? But here, I mean, it's the same courtyard and almost the same wall. Just here, it's clear. So how do we do that? Because the basic problem is, right, you have the background and the foreground. So you have two layers. And these two layers must be merged in a convenient way so that the human visual system can understand it. So, and the way to do this is we highlight things in the foreground because the most powerful depth skew are occlusions, right? And now in order to um, exploit this depth skew, we just highlight things in the front. So with that, you can clearly see what's in front, what's in the back. Um, Yes, and basically this was very compelling, so you can find videos on our web page, and this worked very, very well in many situations. And actually this is also another reason why we work with Nokia, because Nokia now bought Navtech, and so they have all these high quality 3D models of cities. So if you think about this, right, so you have 3D models everywhere, then this is very compelling, because like Superman, you can look through all the buildings. So I expect that this will be released soon on the Nokia phones. But of course, also, there are some problems. So you can see here, this is now if you look through a tree, right? So there are many, many edges. So you cannot see what's behind. Or you have this situation. So there, there's no, there are no edges because the contrast is too low. So this situation also now it looks like it's floating in front. So it means there's some situation when this technique doesn't work. 
So for that, we invented a new technique, and this is this one. So you can see now we want to look behind the building so we can collapse it. Um, because just what we do is we have a 3D model of the environment, so we have a 3D model of this building. So just what we do is we use some uh, vertex shaders, and with the vertex shaders we can use a force field, displace the vertices, and project the live video on it. So you can see there's a car driving through, and this car, this car is also distorted a little. Right? So this is the schema, how it works. Right? So you want to find something in your environment, so then you can collapse the occluders, and you can see what's behind. Of course, now this has some good advantages because that you can use everywhere, but the pr there are also some problems with this technique. So, um, so for example, one problem is that you need to um, have 3D models, right? Whereas with the X-ray technique that I showed first, you don't need 3D models, right? Um, so now, our newest thing, so we presented this last year at ISMAR, is this. So this is now an improved X-ray. Because you can see this is our old X-ray with the edges. Um, but it, there are some problems, right? You can see in this example, again, there are too many edges. But here now, this is our new X-ray. So it's combining foreground and background in a very compelling way. Because basically what we, do and what we did for this technique is we simulated a human eye. So how a human eye would look at the foreground and at the background. It's called saliency. And based on the salient information, we could create this. And you can see, for example, there are um, some umbrellas. So these umbrellas are very strongly highlighted, right? They're in the foreground, or these seats. And there's something in the back, so you can see these buildings, and it's blended together quite nicely. Another advantage here is that um, basically we preserve the color information. Right? Because here you can see with the edges, a lot of color information is lost. And if you imagine navigating in a city, it's very important, right? Because you want color information. And you can see now our new technique preserves colors. That's another advantage. Okay, so this was a quick overview of our outdoor work. So next I want to speak about the indoor work. And because if you work indoors, you have much less restrictions. So you can use more powerful computers and you can do more um, powerful things. So one thing we did, and this is now because I did a talk at TEDx last year. So this is also a live demo on stage. It was quite interesting. And what we do, he what we do here is you can see this is a person wearing a head-worn display using a force feedback device. And with that, you can have this virtual shoe and you can paint on it. And I think that's a very, very compelling application as well, because I will show you later. So we did some tests with it, and it's very easy to use for people. Much, much easier than any mouse-based interface. All right, so you can see we can paint on the shoe, and I uh, you can see some more effects. Oh, okay, just this one. Um, so basically here, so this is, we did, this was at a science exhibition, so similar to Laval, and so we showed that. So this is the logo of my university. And you can see our stand, and there was always a very big queue because we did this for children. This was a science fair for children. And you can see they can paint on some objects. So it's like some cartoon character like Pokemon, and they can paint on it. And none of these children, we had to give any instructions. We just said, okay, put on this helmet, take this pen, and go. Huh? And immediately they could paint. Because imagine if you do this with Maya or some 3D software, I mean, even it took me like a few hours to learn how to paint on an object. But this is very, very easy. Right. So and I think this is for industrial design, like, I mean, I don't have time now to show more things to you. But basically, this combination of augmented reality and haptics is very, very important for uh, industrial design. So what's interesting here is a three-year-old girl. And, but you can see, like, three people had to hold the head-worn display because it's uh, so clunky. Yeah. Okay, now, next, I want to speak about also something we are currently doing. So this is about real-time ray tracing. Um, because probably you know about ray tracing, right? It's a way to generate very, very high quality graphics. Now, why is that important? So if you think about the X-ray example, right? It's very crucial to deliver good graphics in order for people to understand. Because for example, X-ray, it's very unnatural, right? Like me as a human, I'm not supposed to look through things. So you need to have some very good graphics to mitigate these kind of unnatural effects. Um, and that basically, that's what real-time ray tracing can provide. And of course, also a big advantage is you can integrate objects much more nicely into the environment. I show some examples. But here again, I think uh, some um, motivation is that now GPUs, or graphics processing units, so really graphic cards, are very, very powerful. Right? So even your phones have very powerful GPUs. Um, and 
yeah, so that's what I think the motivation, right? So it's possible because you have powerful GPUs and AR really needs good graphics. Um, so I think benefits, right, one is the user enjoyment, because if you think about what the history is showing, let's say, for example, Apple laptops, right, because Apple laptops are very enjoyable to use, right, the user interface and so on, and also iPhones, iPads, why, right, because users enjoy it, right, it's much nicer to use than a Windows computer, to be honest. So, that's a very important point for the, from the business side. Um, and then there's this term presence, right, so presence means if I show you some graphics which are embedded here in this room, um, the nicer the graphics are, or, and the better they blend into this room, the more believable it is. And this believability of uh, virtual graphics is called presence. So I'll show you some examples later on this. And even now, when we started doing this, because of the high quality of graphics, we even found some novel perceptual phenomena which were not known before. Um, so now let me show you one example. So this was uh, last year's ISMAR. We won the best demo award. So basically three labs working together. So it's Gerhard Reitmeier. I showed you earlier his phone tracker. And um, he's from TU Graz. And I think he's currently one of the world leading people for tracking. Um, then there's Matt Svoboda. So this is the guy, so he worked on the PlayStation 3 graphics engine for Sony. So very, very top end graphics person. And basically we made a demo together, which I explain next. And this was very, very nice because we won against 40 other demos. And these demos were from top places, so like INRIA and Georgia Tech, Columbia University, and also companies, yeah? so like Sony, Nokia. And I mean, I think it's very remarkable for a research lab to beat companies, right? Because the companies have more money, better designers, etc., etc. And yeah, so I'll show you. So what we did in this demo is this. So basically, a user can look at their hands, and their hands start burning. And what you can see in this movie is, um, and you can see also it's combined with sound, right? And the sound depends on the distance of your hand. And now the interesting thing of this is, right, because it's technically very, very challenging. Because what we had to do in real time, we made a 3D reconstruction of the hand. And that moment we didn't have Kinect Fusion because just it was released at the same conference. So just we use computer vision because in the head-worn display you have two cameras. And based on these two cameras we do a 3D reconstruction of the hand, like a volumetric reconstruction. And then the fire itself, so maybe i play this again. Um, the fire itself is a particle system which was 10 million particles. And this particle system is running completely on the GPU. And you can see that really the fire is reacting, right? As the user is shaking their hand, so it's really a physical simulation of the fire. And so this is, this is how we showed it at the conference. This is my PhD associate supervisor, Professor Feiner, and he's now playing with that. And you can see, right? So this is what he's seeing. And you can see that the fire is really reacting to his hand. And very, um, basically, you can also check on our webpage. We have many movies of the fire. Right. Now the interesting thing is because we showed this for uh, two or three days and about 100 people used it and something very strange happened which we never thought about it would happen. So people reported some very interesting things. So 20% of the people reported that they could feel heat. Yeah? We would have never thought. So they look at their burning hands and then they were like, ah, it's hot. Yeah? Like even some girl started, stopped using the demo because she is feeling too hot. Very unexpected. Um, even there were some people who smelled the fire. They said they could smell fire. And one person actually had some accident earlier, so the person could not smell anymore. There was no sense of smell. This person, when this person used the demo, smelled the fire. The first smell in 20 years was this fire. So at the moment, currently now, we are um, doing a very um, rigid evaluation of this, because this is a very surprising thing. And basically now we are confirming this actually. So we do very rigid evaluations in the sense of psychology, right? So we get some ethics approval and do some very isolated and very focused study. And it seems like it's really true. And I would have never expected that. So still it's interesting research. It can be a surprise. Um, and I think that's the technical term for this is the synesthesia, right? So it means you have some... Um, um, some stimuli on, uh, stimuli on some sense, right? You see something or and hear something. So on these two channels, it goes into your brain, into your perceptual system. And then on other channels, right, like the sense of smell or the sense of um, perceiving heat, uh, which is the thermostasia. So these two actually are ex uh, inhibited. 
So it's very, very interesting. Okay, so now I show you to conclude my talk, I show just two more examples. Um, because I was mentioning that this sense of presence, right? So about the fire, right? The fire was very believable because it had very high quality graphics. So similar now, I show you some example um, about real time refractions. Right? Refraction is basically the process if you look through glass or you look through different media. Say you look into water, right? You know this effect, there's some fish in the water, you look at the fish, then the fish is really at a different spot as where it appears to be. Because when the light goes into, enters a different medium, then the light waves are bent, right? and this is causing some, uh, some errors. Um, so look at this. Yeah? So this is a virtual sphere, and now this virtual sphere is refracting the environment. And it's uh, quite interesting because, okay, it's now difficult for you to see in a video, but when you try this, it's a very... Because I'm, I already saw there are some augmented reality demos here, and the augmented reality demos just they show some solid objects. Okay. But now, if you have this, right, it is much, much stronger, the feeling you get. You re it's really believable. It's much more believable than the things you can see here, right? And it's just possible now because of GPU ray tracing. So I think it's a very important trend. Okay, the next thing I'll show you is now we can also do this on mobile phones. So the same um, demo that I showed you here, I will now do on my mobile phone. So I hope it won't take too long. Strange, no? Ah, oh, no, it's coming. Okay. Okay, this is now an example, and now, okay, so this I'm now doing live, right? So you can see I'm rotating this cube, and I can uh, pinch, and all these things. And you can see, if you look at the lighting effect, so this is not the lighting you would get with standard OpenGL. So you can see this very, um, yeah, it's like basically like a Gaussian fall off of the light. So this is something you can only achieve with ray tracing. I'll show you another example. So here, this is a torus. And now if you look, okay, now I'm running out of hands. Uh... So if you look at these portions of the torus, right, so you can see there are some very nice shadows. And this effect is, um, this is basically a, like global illumination, right, that you're trying to really get close to the rendering equation, so to get some very realistic, um, and this is basically caused by diffuse interreflections, right. So because here you can see it's direct light, so the light is shining on the surface, but here this is basically light waves come and are bouncing back and forth here, and now in these regions you get some very gradual shadows. Okay, and of course we can do more things. And say, for example, here, right, you can see um, this is this plane is reflecting this, uh, reflecting the sphere, sphere is reflecting the plane, and here we get penumbra shadows, right? So this is also something which is quite difficult to achieve. And it's running on my phone, right? And you can see it's running in real time. So I think I expect that this will change. It's also a big game changer that this is now possible. Um, but now I want to show you an augmented reality demo. Okay, no, it's too dark. Okay. Uh, is it possible to turn up the light a little in this room? But basically, okay, while the, they're working on the light, you can see now, right? So basically, I'm looking on the screen, and you can see there's this sphere, right? So it's the same refraction effect. So it is now running in real time with 15 frames per second. And you can see it's very compelling, right? So you get the feeling that the sphere is there. Unfortunately, now I wanted to show it with you, the audience, because you would be in the sphere and you would be refracted. Um, is it possible? Okay, so let me try on my laptop. Because now also, what I can do is, so I can attach the sphere. So now you can see the sphere is stationary. So it just looks like it's sitting on my laptop. Mine is doing the refraction. Uh, now in the back, there's some light. I don't know, can you see this? 
But I think you get some idea. I mean, you can see the lights. So if you're interested later, I can show this to you. Just approach me and I can show this to you live. Um, is no problem. Okay. Okay, so, well, so I'm almost through with the presentation, but I have to say really one interesting thing, right? Because 12 years ago, I started doing research in this area, and then it was some crazy thing, and nobody thought. But now, the last couple of years, there's this explosion of augmented reality. So I think it's very, very exciting for me. So I feel very lucky that now I'm specialized in this, and now this is taking off. But I can really uh, imagine, maybe in a few years, this will be called Laval augmented reality. I don't know. <laughs> um, yes. Um, Right, so I showed you this. Okay, it's my final slide, but before I stop, so uh, this is a funny story. Because when we made this uh, burning hand demonstration, of course everything is last minute, so this was at the conference, so finally we managed to get this running. And you can see, this was the first time, and this was like, I think, 4.30 in the morning, after very hard work. And you can see it's funny, yeah, because here this guy's hand is burning. And then here, the student's hair is set on fire. <laughs> so it's quite funny. So it doesn't only work with hands, but also with anything hand-colored. So it means also hats. Okay, and uh, yeah, so I expect it to be more Japanese people here. So you can also ask your questions in uh, Japanese or French. It's both okay. Okay, thank you for your attention.